Hello everyone, I'm Kamal Santa Maria. Welcome to our weekly look inside Syria. For over two years now, we've watched the conflict unfold. And much of the focus has been on what the Syrian government, its army and its supporters have been doing to their own people. Most recently, pro-government militias were accused of killing as many as 200 people in the town of Banias. But this is a war. It has two sides. And the opposition rebels can be just as guilty of atrocities. You may have heard about the video released this week showing a rebel commander apparently cannibalizing the body of a government soldier. Now, on the grounds of broadcast decency, we're not going to show you that. But the pictures are disturbing and they're focused attention on the behavior of the opposition. The Free Syrian Army has promised to punish its members for such atrocities. But the FSA has made similar promises before after reports of summary executions of Assad's supporters. The United Nations is now calling for a full investigation into reports of atrocities on both sides. Here's some of what the opposition Syrian National Council said after the video became public. It's also promised that if the video is confirmed as genuine, then the perpetrator will face justice. The Free Syrian Army is a national army above all, it said, formed to defend civilians and deliver the Syrian people from the mentality of revenge and crime. It completely rejects the ill treatment of the wounded and the disfigurement of the dead. But Human Rights Watch isn't convinced. The group's Middle East Deputy Director Nadim Huri reacted by saying, it's not enough for Syria's opposition to condemn such behavior or to blame it on violence by the government. The opposition forces need to act firmly to stop such abuses. One important way to stop Syria's daily horrors, from beheadings to mutilations to executions, is to strip all sides from their sense of impunity. These atrocities are shocking, but so is the obstruction of some Security Council members that still do not support an ICC referral for all sides. So is this one isolated incident, or has the opposition committed more such atrocities? And despite its shocking nature, is it any worse than what the government's been doing? All things to discuss with our guests today. We start in Istanbul with Rania Abu Zaid, Middle East correspondent for Time magazine. In Madison in the United States, James Fetzer, professor emeritus at the University of Minnesota. And also in Istanbul, Louis al Mokdad. He is the political and media coordinator for the Free Syrian Army. We thank you all for joining us today on Inside Syria. My job today really is to play devil's advocate with all of you in all the potential situations. So, Louis al-Muqtad, let me start with you. This is not good, is it? This is a particular brand of atrocity and it doesn't really reflect well on the opposition, does it? Uh, no, sure. Our position in this case is very clear that we are, uh, we will name the crime that as crime and every crime must be called as a crime. That what happened was a crime and we will not give any cover for anyone who committed a crime. And especially if these, these kind of crimes are violate the very principle of the humanity uh, uh, principle. And uh, 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 this, this, uh, this, this, the idea and this, the, this, this all kind, this is our uh, principle of our revolution. This is the principle of the Syrian revolution, that the humanity rights, the freedom, this kind. But actually the problem is, what we are seeing now is all this focusing from the media on this case. Mm -hmm. This is one man case, this is an individual case at the end. This is one man mistake, this is one man crime at the end. This, we can't compare these crimes with the regime crimes. Mm -hmm. the, that kind of crime, it's uh, uh, institutionalized crimes by the regimes. How you can compare by one man mistake or one man crime and uh, uh, the, the regime institution crimes? Let us compare with Albaid over them 400 people and uh, 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 children and kid has been killed let us compare with the scud missiles with the mig missiles uh, uh, we we uh, but at the end we are not covering that crime and mm -hmm. he uh, anyone will act in this way and he commits any crime he should be bring to justice right. he you should be you, brought you to make justice a fair point. and he should face justice you make a fair point that it is one man that said just on a personal level tell me you know before you heard about this would you have believed that this type of thing could be could be perpetrated by someone within the the opposition ranks yeah sure actually now we insist this man or anyone who could commit uh, this kind of crime or any crime against the humanity rights, he should be brought to justice. But uh, in our in, in, F in Free Syrian Army, our position is clear. But we still need a power. We are asking now two years, 
to, to for the international community to help us to prepare ourselves better, to organize our groups on the ground better. So we can, in this kind of case, if we are stronger, if the joint command is stronger, if the FSI, FSA leaders are stronger, that we can brought the justice for those people. But in this case, after two years and more than 90,000 persons have been dead. So I, I, I think this crime will be repeated again. Because at the end of the day, that we are human, that we, we are human, and, there, and, and how you can see 20 million of Syrian people that under shelling, under Scott missiles, they will commit this kind of violence because they will repeat, this is reaction. I think this is not normal reaction. Mm. This is a crime, again. But this is normal, uh, this is a human reaction. How, we, how you can react against the Scott missiles? How you can react if you see your children and your family has been killed by the regime forces? Two years, how you react? Rania Abu Zaid in Istanbul, let me come to you. Uh, I believe Time magazine has actually spoken to the rebel concern, found him and spoken to him. And he, I mean, his basic attitude, and forgive my phrasing here, was it's an eye for an eye. Uh, he found video on the, on the cell phone of that uh, government soldier which showed atrocities there. And it's, well, part of war, I guess he would say. Yes, we did uh, manage to track the uh, the individual down, and in fact, uh, Time magazine has been in possession of this video uh, since April. We've been trying to verify the authenticity of it. Um, you know, this is one very sick individual, and I think that most people can agree on that. Uh, this is two years into a very brutal, very bloody war that is not sanitized. You know, it's not the kind of war uh, that we're seeing with the use of drones, for example, where an operator sits a million miles miles away and uses the joystick and doesn't see what happens, uh, you know, when he drops a bomb mm. on, uh, on a village. This is a very personal war. It's, it's being fought often by people who were once neighbors. It's uh, dehumanizing. Some of these forces, the rebel forces and the loyalist forces, are sometimes a few hundred meters away from each other. And they hurl insults before they hurl bullets. Mm. So, you know, this is, this is quite brutal. And it also comes uh, against, you know, a backdrop of, of the these uh, other uh, very uh, disturbing images that we've seen, for example, of Banyas, where we saw uh, what looks like hundreds of people who were killed, and some of the photos certainly show men, women, and children who were who were dead and basically tossed in, in the corner against a wall like last week's trash. So it's a very, very ugly war. You've been reporting from inside Syria, haven't you? So it's an apt program that you're here inside Syria. Tell us just briefly more about some of the stuff you've, you've seen and heard about there. Well, you know, like I said, it's uh, two years into a conflict where little girls now can tell the difference between certain types of artillery. Mm. Uh, you know, I just came back from Idlib province. I uh, spent about a week in there, and I'm due to go back into another part of Syria in a few days. I spent several nights in a, in a bomb shelter where, you know, uh, mortar fire was, was falling in the same neighborhood that I was in, and people were wondering which of their neighbors' m houses may have been hit. It's, it's very ugly. It's very disturbing. You, uh, it's also the, the other thing about this, uh, this individual, this Abu Sagar, is that, you know, while his crime is quite atrocious for all of the reasons that uh, Mr. Mugdad outlined, we, we also saw horrible things things in other conflicts, like in Iraq, for example, they used drills on some people. But perhaps one of the differences is that uh, the Syrian war is, uh, you know, we're seeing all of this amateur video, this prolific amateur video that is very quickly uploaded onto mm. YouTube. It's almost like a YouTube war, if you like. So uh, we're seeing a lot more of, of the reality of war, if you like. Yeah, an element of propaganda, isn't it? James Fetzer, let me bring you into the conversation. Good to have you with us from the United States. Both our previous guests have made the point that these are the actions of one man up against institutionalized violence, if you want to call it that. That said, how does it reflect on the United States, for example, the UK, other Western nations who've decided to align themselves with the opposition and in some cases support them? Does it, is, it, is it blowback for them? Well, I think most uh, serious analysts recognize that this is not, in fact, in indigenous movement, that this is not a group of, of rebels who are protesting the Assad government, but an attempt by the Western powers uh, to dismantle Syria in accordance with a plan designed by the Israelis. I mean, I mean what we have here is most interesting because it's a form of arrogance by the, 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 the alleged opposition 
that is very much working to their negative effect, just as Israel's attack here on the two sites, uh, taking out missiles and uh, attacking uh, uh, presumably a chemical supply base, has had the uh, striking effect of providing an opportunity for Vladimir Putin to reinforce the supply of weapons to the Syrian government and to reaffirm the Russian interest here with Russian warships, which I believe represents a decisive turning point. I do not believe that there will be an overthrow of the Assad government by this force and that those who are parties to it, including Barack Obama, whom Netanyahu very cleverly tried to entrap by drawing a red line over the use of chemical weapons, where Netanyahu himself was in the position to ensure that chemical weapons would then be used. So, Even so the, the, the gist Obama, of what you're saying, forgive me interrupting appears, you, James, the, the is, gist of what you're not, saying is that is the, not, the West of the United States has backed back the wrong horse here. They've not done it right, basically. That's, that's quite correct. Recall Wesley Clark, when he returned from Supreme Commander Allied Forces Europe after 9-11, was confronted by a, a plan to destabilize seven Arab countries in the next five years. This is part and parcel of that plan. It's happened in, in Afghanistan, it's happened in Iraq, it happened in Libya, where it was so obvious when the first act of the rebel force there was to declare a new central bank. But in Syria, I believe they have met their match, and I mm. do not believe the outcome is going to be what Netanyahu and others had anticipated. Okay, Louis al Muqtad in Istanbul, let me bring you back into the conversation. Um, how much damage do you feel an incident like this and other atrocities does to the FSA? And to tie in with what we were talking about, James, the amount of international help. You said earlier you've been crying out for international help for so long, but then incidents come along which might make those other countries waver a bit and think, well, are we backing the right horse, as James was saying? Actually, uh, we don't feel damaged as much as we feel that surprised. Really now, all the Syrian people, they are really surprised. Uh, look at all the, at the Western media, how much they focus on this videotape. That we are broadcasting every day tens of video that it shows a, a, a more worst crime from the regime forces. It shows a hundred times. Every day we are losing around 300, between 300 and 400 souls in Syria. Mm -hmm. We are losing in every, like in, in, in Banyas, like as your guest from Istanbul said, Mrs. Abu Zaid, uh, uh, we, in Banyas, just in Banyas, we lose around 400. Look at mm -hmm. Hule, Al Kbair, look what happened in Aleppo, in Homs, in Dara. Why they didn't focus that? that much on the video. What uh, I know that this is a crime and this is miserable crime and this is unbelievable crime. But why, let me, let me be honest, what we saw from that, the international media as CNN and BBC and ABC, all the uh, respectful uh, media on the West, uh, that they are focusing 24 hours in these videotapes, that the, we, we imagine that they, they didn't see anything that from the Syrian revolution yet. Now, we are feeling surprised, but actually what we feel uh, uh, more strange that, uh, that it's all excuses that they are just putting all these cases and just mm. to put more excuses for the international community, for the United Nations, even for the United States, even for President Obama, that to put more red lines and Bashar al-Assad across the more, line, more red lines. And now we are saying what? Look at the Syrian people that this is they are they eating each other hearts and this is uh, 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 this is um, like a civil war mm -hmm. and they they killing each others this is not revolution this is not a, bro a, a fight for freedom no the Syrian people, they are fighting for their, free, their freedom. Whatever they want to, to imagine or whatever they want, after two years, the inter they should feel shame. The international community, the mm. United Nations forces, they should feel shame that they left us alone under the chilling two years. And now they are asking why this crime happened. Why? Because mm. there's his, this person and um, not give him any excuses. Mm. And now I'm asking, we ask it in the joint command officially for him to bring to justice, to go to court, and to catch him and take him to court. But let me tell you about this man. And again, I'm not giving excuses for this man. Sure. Abu Saqqar, the person who, who appeared in the video, he's a group leader in Homs. 
He has a small group and he's a group leader. What, what, when they killed this, this soldier, the regime soldier, they cut his, his, uh, his, uh, his uh, telephone, his mobile phone. Mm -hmm. And we can give this mobile phone for the, all the, the, the international community or the international leader that they want to see what's inside this phone. A uh, girl uh, 11 years old. It's had been killed, and it's been uh, 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 a woman and children. He killed a woman and children. He burned houses inside. He burned he burned kids that uh, 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 young age, and he killed them in very in very. Uh, uh, I don't want to see just bad way. No, mm. not, not humanity, not humanity at all. Mm. That's what Abu Sakkar says in this moment, and that's why he react not as a human, not as a normal person, and not as a normal Syrian people. The Syrian people, they are civilized, and mm -hmm. they are civilized, and they are, they are seven years old in, uh, age, in years in this, this ground. We are fighting Bashar al-Assad, and but with, when he left us alone, and all of just watching the TV and watching the Syrian people, that that's what you will see at the end. It's okay, Louis, let's uh, go to James in uh, the United States. Just. Maybe you can give me a little bit of international perspective, because I think Louis made a good point. This type of incident, this type of video, it gets the big headlines. And Louis was saying there's so much video out there of all the atrocities that have happened on the government side. Do those make much of an impact in, say, for example, the US media or any international media do you look at? Do those make headlines like the way this has? I know this is, there's shock value here, but, but do they? Well, if we go back two years to the beginning of the alleged uprising, there were slaughters of villages that were rather obviously conducted by mercenaries. This had nothing to do with the Assad government. It was being done as a public relations move to try to motivate support for what was supposed to be another aspect of the Arab Spring. But in fact, all of this is completely contrived. It has nothing to do with freedom and democracy. It has to do with the Israeli plan to dismantle all of the sophisticated Arab states, break them into little statelets, especially conflicting to one, uh, between one another. Say where Iraq would be one part Sunni, one part Shia, one part Kurd, and analogously in Syria, were it successful so that Israel could have uncontested domination of the Middle East. I do not believe there's any serious student of the politics of the situation who doesn't appreciate that these are the larger dimensions of the situation we confront where the Western powers have overplayed their hand and Israel in particular committed a colossal blunder by providing an opportunity for Vladimir Putin whom I regard as the only true international statesman on the world scene to resupply the Syrians with these very sophisticated missiles which are causing all of the military powers involved to reconsider their situation because Russia is going to stand firm and I believe has made a decisive move to resolve the situation in favor of the Assad government. Rani Abu Zaid, I hope you can hear me there in Istanbul. Just to get your thoughts, because you brought this point up earlier as well about the sort of YouTube battle, the, the, the media battle, this sort of thing. Is this the type of thing which can blow a conflict out of proportion? Obviously, the Syrian conflict is huge, and, and Louis made the point about all the, the videos we've seen coming out of the other side's atrocities. But then one thing like this can almost derail the whole thing, the whole narrative. Well, I'm not sure that it can derail the whole narrative. I think that's a little bit too broad. I have to keep things in perspective. It's the act of one man. It has been condemned by various elements of the Syrian opposition. It, it is. And, you know, and, sorry, as you I'm said, jump there in. are also... It, it is the yes. act of one man, but yeah, on. it, the, the problem is the way it's consumed, and maybe the media is part of the problem here. The fact we're discussing it, it yes. makes it a big issue, doesn't it? Yes, it does. And uh, just going back to what I, I, I heard before the line cut out, you were asking whether or not this is perhaps an excuse and whether Western states might be reconsidering their support. Mm. Well, let's be honest. I mean, you know, the West, I don't think the actions of this one man are holding back Western support for the, for the rebels. For the past year or so, the reason, one of the key reasons why the West has dithered, dithered over whether or not to arm the rebels is because of Jabhat al-Nusra. And that's their primary concern, not the actions of this one man. Well, you've brought up al-Nusra, so that might be worth having a talk about just now as well, because... Uh, because back in April, the head of al-Nusra Front in Syria formally pledged its allegiance to the al-Qaeda leader, Iman al-Zawahri. Now we've also seen reports of large numbers of fighters from the Free Syrian Army, even entire units actually defecting to al-Nusra Front. 
Just want to remind our viewers here, al-Nusra established in January 2012. Since then, it's used car bomb suicide attacks in its efforts to bring down the Assad government. It's got about 5,000 members and is believed to be largely funded and trained by al-Qaeda in Iraq. In December, the U.S. State Department put al-Nusra on its list of terrorist organizations. It said it was responsible for hundreds of attacks and the deaths of countless civilians. Louis El Mokhtar, let me come back to you in Istanbul. How does that work for the FSA? It's, you know, it's almost that it's fighters, some of them, not all of them, of course, but some of them are looking elsewhere to a more hardline group like Al Nusra. First of all, let me be clear. We have been re repeated hundreds of times that we are not responsible about any act of Jabhat al Nusra. And we are not connected anyway with Jabhat al Nusra. And especially after their last statement and the famous, uh, uh, the famous tape who, who, who gave Abu Muhammad al Jolani, he gave the loyalty for Ayman al Zawahri, we announced that very clearly that we think Al Qaeda and we believe that Al Qaeda is a terrorist organization that we are, and this is not our idea and what, not our targets, that we want to build a civil democratic country. Mm -hmm. That's what the Syrian people want. But when you leave the Syrian, again, when you leave the Syrian two years, no one helps them. So some fighters, some foreign fighters, they, are, they have some radical uh, and some extremist group. They came inside Syria and they said for the people that we will help you to get Bashar al-Assad down and to finish from Bashar al-Assad. We don't want anything, just we came here to help yeah. you. At the beginning, the people, some people, they believe them. They said, okay, let's us coordinate with them. They will help us. They are organized well, they are armed well, and they have their own sources of money from their networks. So they are, and at, at the, the, that time, the three Syrian army groups was short in everything. We were short in money, we were short in uh, armed, we are short in funds, everything. We have no sources, just some Arabic countries, they help, they help, and they help by, by very, very, very uh, uh, low, level so then after they made their statement I I, uh, I think that and I believe and I talked to the Syrian always and actually uh, uh, yesterday there was a, a meeting in the uh, joint chef commands and I met a group's leader and every day I'm with them that they said we are not Al-Qaeda and we mm. can't work with these people even if they want to help us but we can't work with them because some of them, they gave their loyalty to Ayman al-Zawahri. And we said that Ayman al-Zawahri, it's the most red line in the world because he's a terrorist. That's what we believe. Because he committed a crime against a, hum uh, a civilian in many countries. And they, even if they want to help us, we don't want their help. But again, can you imagine, imagine yourself that under the chilling of uh, Amig and Sokhoi air jets and under the chilling of Scott missiles, and one man, he came to you and told you that I'm going to protect you, I'm going to help you, I'm going just at least to save your house from a Shabiha forces and the regime forces when they will came to kill your children. Mm. So you, are you going to ask this man what you believe in? Uh, for who you are organized, did you work with Ayman al Zawahri or no? If the international community they are honest, we warned them from the beginning. If you leave the forces of the, the Free Syrian Army alone, you will find the extremist group in Syria, and those extremist group will be bigger and bigger and stronger. And today we are saying that clearly, if they leave us alone and again, and they will leave us with Bashar al-Assad alone under his chilling, they will find everything in Syria. They will, they will change these people. They will change even, they, they change the, the Syrian people idea about freedom. How much they trust that the West are believing in freedom and they will help for to, the Syrian people to get their freedom. Today, we didn't find anyone with us. We find only us alone without no one and we are getting killed every day. And we are losing our country every day. So a final thought then from Rania Abu Zaid in Istanbul. Again, as someone who's been inside Syria, I like to get your views as someone who's, who's been there and can tell us, do you feel that the FSA can get control of this thing or is it such a sort of battle that these things will happen, that you've got splinter groups, that you've got individuals who will do this and it's not really about getting, getting things under control, individual events under control? 
Well, the FSA has never really been an organized military uh, structure in the form of an army or something like that. It's just a loose franchise outfit, and it has had very little top-down command and control. Uh, certainly, some men have tried to organize themselves at a very local level. For a particular battle, for example, you'll find that uh, the certain FSA units and also other units that are outside of the FSA will sometimes try and coordinate ahead of a certain battle or in a particular area. But that's about the extent of the organization that uh, exists you know, w w within the FSA and also within the other fighting groups that are present in Syria. So my thanks to our guests in Istanbul was Rani Abu Zaid and Louis Al Mokdad and in Madison, James Fetzer. Thank you to all of you. And thank you for joining us. Remember, Al Jazeera has extensive and continuing coverage of what's happening in Syria, not just on this program, but with our hourly news programs and, of course, online at aljazeera.com. I'm Kamal Santamaria. We'll see you again soon.